And so this is also something you have to do for startup of continuous plants, but this is what you require to do every batch. Okay? You have to have some sequence of operations that you use. And you can implement this in, in some kind of logic form, which we'll mention but not really talk about. Okay, you have safety things, that's fine. You might do control during the batch, so in addition to specifying certain sequential steps, you might want to control temperature during a batch reactor or something like this. Um, you have to control production, like how long you're going to run the batch, how many batches you're going to run, when you're going to run them, things like this. And then also you might have this run-to-run -run control. Use the results from the last batch to improve the run of the current batch. I think I talked about all this. Unless I, let's see if I missed anything critical. Um, yeah, so control during the batch might be something like this. So instead of, so when we think about set points for like temperature, for a continuous process, we usually think about something like this, right? We're run at a constant set point. You know, maybe we'll decide we want to run at another temperature for whatever reason. And the idea that controllers track that set point. So in a batch process, you know, it's going to typically be something like this, like a trajectory. You understand? You want to follow a desired trajectory of temperature throughout the batch. You have to calculate this somehow, which we don't really talk about, but. It's going to be a function of time, and so it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of problem, and that's, that's what this says right here. Okay, run, run, control, da da da, da. okay, did that. All right, so who, who's the person that came up to me and asked me about programmable logic controllers? Do you want to admit who you are? No? All right, that's fine. Um, so someone asked me about, like, are we going to talk, are you going to talk about programmable logic controllers? And I'm like, not really, but actually, yes, but not much, okay? So if you go into a plant that's discrete, you know, batch manufacturing, discrete manufacturing, um, you'll see tons of these so-called programmable logic controllers, okay? You can tell by the name, programmable logic controllers, that they're good for programming logic, okay? <laughs> it's like a Webster definition there. All right. Um, so in other words, they're ideal things that you can specify to execute a, s a series of steps. They're very small and modular and relatively cheap. And you can program these things like, you know, at this time open this, at this time do that. So it's different than the kind of larger distributed control systems you tend to have for um, continuous manufacturing. And the truth is, you normally you'll have these things communicating with much bigger computer control systems. but. Um, so anyway, control batch processes, right, you have to sequence steps and execute them in a specific order. Um, you can represent this information, which we don't talk much about, in terms of a logic kind of flow diagram. Um, and you can implement these things in these programmable logic controllers. Okay. And these are very simple devices compared to typical process control computers. So they do basically two things. They do sequential operations, which I'll get to more in a minute. I keep saying it. And they can also do simple things like PID control. So you, so you could use something like this to start up a reactor and then control temperature in the reactor as well. Okay? But it wouldn't be as sophisticated as the distributed control systems we normally use. Um, and this is the key kind of hardware you see in batch plants. Okay? And there's people that usually more at the technician level. You wouldn't want to do this if you were, a, in my opinion, if you were a chemical engineering BS or more. But there's people that specialize in using and programming these things. You know, you, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's not, not that exciting either. So it's best someone else do it. All right. Um, so here's an example of a, a logic, series of logic steps. So you have this reactor here. Okay. You can see in this reactor that you have two components, reactants, right, called A and B. You have a mixer. You have three sensor measurements. Okay, for, um, let me see, so this is level low, this is level high, and what's LX? Oh, X. <laughs> That's right, it is actually. Level extra high. <laughs> you thought you were making a joke, but it turned out to be the truth, all right? And then, um, <coughs> then over here you have an exit, okay? And the idea of these valves, you see these things S called solenoids, that means the valve's either all the way open or all the way closed. We're not worried about grading responses. So we're not going to open it 20% or something. We're going to open it all the way or shut it off. And this says how this would be used, okay? So first thing, of course, now I have to be able to identify these things. I remember looking at this the other day, and I didn't even see HS4, so I don't even know what that is. Uh, that's what you get for not reading the book. But anyway, that's fine. 
Um, so let's just not worry about this. Let's just say that says start, okay? So first thing we do is open this valve and feed in reactant A, okay? And you do that until the level reaches, looks like this point, right? So once the level reaches this point, then what you're going to do is this step. You're going to close this valve, you're going to open this valve, and then you're going to start mixing, okay? And then you're going to keep adding component B, no A, right, just B, until the level gets to this extra high point. It's interesting terminology. And once you get the level reaches that point, then you're going to close this thing off, and then you're going to open the outlet thing, right? And you're going to keep draining the tank until this thing gets, what's, gets less than this level here. And then you're going to close, what's, then you're going to close this valve, and then you're going to stop mixing. So you see, it's, it's not that complex. Like, feed in A for a while, then feed in B and start mixing so reaction takes place. Once the inventory in this reactor gets sufficiently high, drain it and collect the product, right? But it's a lot, oops, sorry, be a lot different than what we normally think about reactor control where we're feeding these things in continuously and this out continuously, so it's, it's a lot different. Okay, and this is the kind of thing you can program in one of those logic controllers. You can do all these steps sequentially. Um, and that's what they're good at doing. All right, so let's say that during this batch step, okay, like in particular, during this step here, right, this is the step where reaction is occurring, that you might want to do control during the batch. You understand, at this point, the system is just evolving by itself. Whatever's <laughs> happening is happening. <laughs> You're not doing anything to mitigate. So there, you know, there, there's probably a temperature here and you would usually measure it, but you're not trying to control it or anything at this point. You're just letting it be whatever it's going to be. And then you just drain it when it gets full. Okay. So you might actually want to do some control during the batch. And that's um, discussed here. Um, right, so yeah, I want to do control. Again, this might be, or typically is quite challenging because there's no steady state operating point and the systems go over a wide range of conditions. Okay. And when systems go over a wide range of conditions, two things happen that are bad for us. First of all, if the system is inherently nonlinear, you understand no system is really linear, really, just think of it. But um, they're often linear enough, or you operate them over a really small window where they behave linearly, that you can just pretend they're linear. That's what we've been doing the whole time. We've been in denial, and we're pretending all our processes are linear. Um, and when they operate continuously and you can keep them near the set point, then that's usually not too bad of assumption. Often works, okay? So if you operate over a wide range of conditions, this, w this assumption usually won't be true, okay? The other thing we don't talk about much is that usually our models are not perfect. Well, they're never perfect, okay? Um, they may be very high fidelity models, very accurate, or they might be quite inaccurate. But I can tell you one thing is that the wider range of conditions you operate over, the more you'll see your model's bad, right? So, I mean, one of the great things about feedback control, even though I haven't really sold it this way, is that it doesn't require a perfect model for it to work, right? So we design these controllers based on a model, <coughs> and because our controllers have integral action, and because feedback control is just such a wonderful idea to begin with, you don't need a perfect model for this to work. But if the model is not <coughs> very accurate and you operate over a wide range of conditions, so in other words, your model of temperature wherever that went here is not very good. So you have a model that says, oh, if I change the coolant, I know how that'll affect temperature. If that model's not very good, you won't be able to track this desired set point very well. Okay. So these two problems will occur. Uh, Nonlinearities in the process and any inadequacies of your model are going to become quite exasperated if you operate a batch system over a large range of conditions. Um, yeah, yeah. And then the other thing, um, so let's say you operate a continuous process and you, you're like um, making, you have a distillation column, you don't like the overhead composition. Well, you change the reflux or whatever and eventually you get the overhead composition you want hopefully. That's because you have like an infinite amount of time, right? You're going to get it there eventually. But if you're running a batch process, you just might run out of time, right? You can't get the product property or the, the thing you want to control back on target before the batch is done. And it's, it's common then that when you're making um, products in batch that some things you do are irreversible. Like if you're, if you're etching a silicon wafer, you can't go back, right? If you screw it up, you screw up the etching, you can't go back and you know, re-etch it. It's, it's lost. 
And if you're making a polymer and the polymer molecular weight gets screwed up, it's going to be very hard during the batch to do this. Do you guys, I know the answer here, I'm afraid, but I'm going to ask anyway. Do you guys study crystallization in the separations course? You mentioned it. Well, okay. So, so, you know, crystallization is a big unit operation in the pharma industry, for example, because you're going to want to crystallize the, the products, APIs, you heard this term, active pharmaceutical ingredients. You're gonna crystallize these things and eventually put them into tablet form or something like this for delivery. Um, and a crystallizer is usually run in batch, so you seed it and then you make crystals and then you stop at some point. And you're, you're interested in the so-called crystal size distribution, right? How many small crystals and big crystals. Um, once you screw up that crystal size distribution, you almost have no handles to fix it, you see. So it's common in batch processes that you, you're making products that have kind of more sophisticated specifications on product quality, like size distribution, uh, molecular weight, um, stuff like this. And once something goes wrong, you won't be able to fix it typically. So that means you get to throw the batch away or... If it's a pharmaceutical, no, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say salt to another country. <laughs> it's like we have believe, reason to believe this is toxic, uh, but it's cheap. Okay. All right. You're not recording this, are you? <laughs> All right. This probably shouldn't be recorded. I didn't mean that, obviously. All right. Okay, so here's another reactor example um, to give you a flavor for how some of these th this things might work. All right, so we have a reactor and we have three reactants, okay? And you can see that we measure the flow of each reactant and then there's something called a totalizer, right? What does a totalizer mean? It means you want to add a to some total amount of reactant one, two, and three, and this keeps track of the total that you've, you've added, right? So you're not so interested in the flow itself, you're interested in how much total flow goes in there, okay? And so that's kind of shown here. Right? It just says, I'm going to add, so why? Because what you're going to do, since you don't care about the actual flow, just the total amount you add, you're just going to open this valve completely until you've added as much of component A as you, or reactant one as you want, and then you're going to shut it down, right? Open it all the way until you've added enough, then close it, then add reactant B, sorry, it's called reactant two, and then finally add reactant three, you see? So you're not, you're not interested in the actual flow, just add the right total amount. All right. Once you have all the reactants in there, then you might decide, I would like the reaction to take place. And so what you're going to do is you're going to heat up the reactor, right? Because the reaction probably doesn't occur at like a high temperature, or at least the rate is negligible. So you're going to heat this thing up, and then you're going to run at a constant temperature for a while, and then you're going to cool it down, and then eventually you're just going <coughs> to drain this, drain this reactor out, okay? And then I'm trying to figure out why do we have... Why are we interested in pressure control for this thing? Temperature control is kind of obvious. And I should mention that, I guess we haven't seen things like this, but it's pretty common. This is called a split range temperature controller. So let's say, for example, you, um, you wanted to cool the reactor down. or heat, Let's say you wanted to heat the... <laughs> Sometimes you want to heat the reactor up, right? Like here. You can't heat the reactor up with cooling water, right? But once you get up here, you actually want to control the temperature, and to that you have to remove heat, so you need cooling water. So you need both utilities, cooling water and steam both. So this controller just manipulates whichever one is necessary to achieve the temperature control you want. So it's called a split range controller. Um, so pressure <coughs> control, I'm not really sure. I mean, assuming these are liquid, fa I guess as the react reaction takes place, maybe we get some um, some production of some, some compounds that go in the gas phase and increase the temperature, so we're going to do some pressure control, apparently. But if we do, um, we might want to do something like this. So run um, at a temperature, uh, low pressure, ramp it up, run at a, some higher pressure for a while, then ramp it back down. But looking at the temperature control, the idea here is during this batch, you would want to be able to control this trajectory, right? You start heating it, obviously you'd probably want to get this to heat up as fast as you can, control the temperature at this value, and then cool it back down quickly, extract the re reactant. So that's an example we want to do, control of the temperature actually during the batch. Um, this is a fine. <laughs> it's not, not that um, earth shattering. So here's our typical PID controller, okay? So this says, right, you have a proportional part, you have an integral part, and then we typically have this bias term. Right, and we have this bias term because we learned that 
even if the error is zero, there's usually some non-zero flow rate required, right? And that's this bias value. And the controller figures out what this value should be. Um, but if you were to run a batch process, your initial thinking would be, you know, I'll just have no, no initial value at all because I'm starting from zero, right? I'm not running continuously. I'm, I'm starting at time equals zero, so this controller should be able to do it, okay? This might be a reactor uh, controller, right? This is the flow rate of coolant. This air represents air and the temperature. And so the old, only point of this um, slide is that you can intelligently choose this value to get better startup performance of the temperature controller. Um, and that's what's shown here. So this thing is called preload. In other words, this is the amount that of cooling you're going to add at time equals zero. Heat, in this case, heating, I guess, right? You want to heat this thing up from some initial value to some final value, and then you want to run into this value. And so rather than let the controller figure out over time, I'm too cold and slowly ramp up the thing, you're going you're gonna to inject a lot of heat to begin with just by picking this value, okay? <coughs> and so this just shows you what happens if you pick different values for this preload. So if you don't pick any, in other words, you pick it to be zero, it's, it's too slow. It takes too, too long to warm up because the controller has to kind of wind itself up. If you pick it to be too high, okay, which is this value here, you might overshoot the set point and that may not be good. And so according to these gentlemen, this is, and they don't even tell you what the right value is, at least not in the slide. There's somewhere between this thing being 100 and being zero that they consider to be the right rate. A tiny bit of overshoot. Then it gets to the set point pretty quickly. It's fast, much faster if you don't have any preload, not too fast, not too much overshoot. So, um, so that's that, okay. All right, so this, I don't do much material manufacturing examples because I don't really work in that area. And if you know anything about professors, we only want to talk about what we know and what we're interested in, okay? And some people teach classes from that perspective too and you probably don't even have any idea what they're talking about, but that's, that's fine. Um, so this is a process called rapid thermal processing. You may have heard about this. You may actually have some experience with this um, in a lab. I don't know. But the idea here is that we want to heat up a silicon wafer very quickly to a very high temperature. So about 1200 degrees, we want to do this in seconds, right? So it's a very fast process um, and a very demanding process. And then we're going to cool this wafer back down um, and you have to cool it back down a lot slower than you heat it back up because otherwise this wafer will crack or break and that'll be a problem, right? So due to the thermal shock, we have to cool it down kind of quickly, okay? And just mention here, you can uh, obtain kind of high heating cooling rates with lamps and lasers and things like this. This isn't my exact domain. I guess this was in the book because I wouldn't have thought of this myself. <laughs> but anyway, that's fine. Um, so key thing here is that you, I mean, from the description here, you can probably get the idea that the control problem here is to control the temperature and to get the temperature to go up really quickly and then to get it to come down not too quickly so that it won't crack the wafer. So it's a temperature control problem, okay? Um, and the idea here is that, so the, the wafer, so you have a temperature of the wafer itself is what you're interested in, but the wafer is in a chamber where you do this heating um, and you understand it's not easy to measure the temperature of a wafer in situ. Like what are you going to put a thermocouple into the wafer itself, right? You can't really do this. So what are you going to do? You're going to put a thermocouple into a thermal well of the chamber where the wafer is made and you're going to measure the temperature of that chamber, not the thermocouple itself. Now, if you heat it up really slowly, those things will be in <laughs> equilibrium and it won't make much difference. But when you're heating at these kind of rates, there might be a substantial difference between the temperature of the chamber and of the wafer itself. Right, you can appreciate this because of, you can't transfer heat that fast to get to equilibrium, okay? And then I had some cool pictures here which you can't see, but that thing's a wafer. I think that's to a solar cell for a solar cell. And then this looks like the process to make it, but you can barely see it. Sorry about that. Um, I think I stole these from the web with no reference, so sorry about that. All right, so the point of this example is to illustrate something we haven't talked about which is a way of handling nonlinearities. It's called gain scheduling, okay? So if you go back to this pH example, okay, let's say you wanted to control pH, low pH over here. You understand? This, the slope of this line is essentially the process gain. It says how much base or acid, well, in this case it's base clearly, you're adding. Um, how much base do you add to get a certain change in the pH? Over here, you can add a lot of base and get a small change in pH. And same thing up here, that means the gain is small. 
okay? But here, if you add base, a little bit of base, you get a big change. The gain is huge there, okay? So what are you gonna do? Well, one thing you could do is try to use, so you, hopefully you remember this. that the controller gain is usually inversely proportional to the process gain. So the process gain is small, you need a big controller gain. That's here and here. If it's a small process, sorry, l large process gain, you need a small controller gain. That's in here, in the middle, okay? <laughs> so the idea of gain scheduling is that if we know this behavior is occurring and we can figure out where we are operating, low gain, high gain, we can adjust the controller gain accordingly. Like use a small gain where we need it, use a big gain when we need it. That's called gain scheduling. It's, it's quite common. It's a way of overcoming the fact the system is nonlinear. Okay? Um, right, okay. PID controllers usually work. Why? Because the system's usually reasonably linear where we operate it. it when it's highly nonlinear and or operates over a big range, then it may be really hard to get good control with one set of parameters. Okay? So, I said I wouldn't do this, but in the lab, what used to be the lab, um, <laughs> did you guys do pH? Or you're not doing not doing pH control. Maybe they wait do that in the spring. Okay. We're doing, but, we're doing it next, uh, like starting tomorrow. Are you doing level control really yeah. though? Not really pH control yet, right? Well, that's fine. Yeah. But in the spring, guys, will do um, a pH control, hopefully, and what you'll 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 see this problem firsthand of how tuning this controller becomes really really difficult. Um, so same thing exists for this kind of thing, um, these rapid thermal processing, is that um, obviously operate over a wide range. You're heating the thing from ambient conditions to 1200 degrees in seconds. That's a big range. Well, couldn't be too much bigger. Um, and they tend to exhibit nonlinear behavior as well. So you can use this idea of gain scheduling, right? And then the idea is that you can change the process or the controller gain according to what you think the current value of the, of the process gain is, okay? And that's what I said here. Gain scheduling, you implement this by adjusting the controller gain according to where you're at. So it really comes down to the following. So here's an example, right? If I gave you this transfer function, hopefully you could do the following. You could either derive IMC tuning or you could just go into the table, 12.1, and you could pick these values out, right? If you have a transfer function that looks like this and you use a first order filter, you get an IMC controller that looks like this. It's a PI controller and that's the gain and that's the integral time just taken right out of the table, okay? So you can see here that what I'm gonna assume for this example is that the time constant of the process is roughly invariant to operating conditions. So how quickly it responds doesn't matter, but the amount it responds ch changes a lot. So I'm gonna assume the tau is constant, doesn't change with operating conditions. That means that integral time will never change. I'll keep that the same. But you can, and so if tau is constant, I'll pick my tau c to be constant, you know, like one half tau. And, the, and then the idea here is that the process gain changes, I'm gonna change the controller gain accordingly. So to do this gain scheduling, right, you have to understand how the process gain changes with operating conditions. And if you do, you can just change this in real time, right? If you have a value of the process gain, you can use this formula and just keep updating the controller gain. So as this thing gets smaller and smaller, then the controller gain is going to get larger and larger and vice versa, right? So, so over here, if you want to do it for this pH example, you'd have to have some way of knowing what the current value of the gain is, right? So that's a, that's a real challenge behind gain scheduling is how do you figure out what the controller gain is a function of operating conditions, but not getting into that. So this shows the relative performance for this thermal processing system here. What are we doing on time? Not bad. All right, so here's the temperature, here's time. You can see, well, they, pro they promised that we would heat it up to 1,000 degrees, 1,200, but we're only heating up to 1,000, that's okay. Starting at ambient conditions or <laughs> in a refrigerator, potentially. Um, and so this must be a model result. I'm not sure exactly how they generated these results, but this is the desired um, temperature, okay? And then this is the actual temperature of the wafer. So the dark line is the temperature of the chamber and then this is the actual temperature of the wafer, right? They're not the same because the heating rates are just so high that you can't transfer heat that fast. Um, so you wanna heat it up very quickly, in this case to 1000 degrees, keep it there and then cool it back down and you don't wanna cool it back down too fast, okay? Um, and so the point of this example is to show, even though the details are not given, 
that with this kind of gain scheduling controller, again, we're trying to track this ramp. And all we can do at this point is just control the chamber temperature with the idea that we know it's not quite the wafer temperature, but what are you going to do? Okay. You can see it actually does quite a good job. In this case, they go up to 950. I don't know. This may be an experimental result. I really don't know. Looks like it. So here's time. Here's temperature. So we're starting at 700. This is a lot different. <laughs> okay. We're still going up a lot, 250 degrees, but not quite as demanding. So here's the ramp that you want to track. And then you, this is the actual um, temperature that you get. It does quite well. Okay. I thought It'd be nice in this example if they showed what happens if you didn't do gain scheduling. But if you didn't do gain <coughs> scheduling, you would have to settle for one of the two things. So either the gain's going to be way too high, and I have to admit, I don't know when the gain is high and when it's low, to be honest with you. But I'm guessing that the gain starts out pretty high. So if you, like let's say this is a laser and you use the laser, it's much easier to heat it up from 200 to 400 than from 800 to 1,000. That would be my intuition here. So the gain is large here, process gain, and gets smaller up here. So you can see this gain scheduling controller does, does pretty well. And this is a very common thing in <coughs> all process control is that you'll hear people use this term of gain scheduling. It's not, you know, it's not used, it's not like PID control, you don't use it all the time, but so it's like typical thing. You try PID control. If it doesn't work, you try to figure out what went wrong. If you find out what went wrong, the system's nonlinear, try gain scheduling. This is the next step. All right, run to run control. So this is not much detail here, just give you some idea. So again, for most batch processes, it's very hard to get measurements of things during the batch that have to do with product quality. Okay. So you know, I've, I've worked with ExxonMobil on like polymer reactors. They have a polymer reactor where the, t the residence time in the reactor is six minutes, right? They get measurements of the um, polymer quality every four hours, right? You should see that's a, that's a mismatch, right? So the, t so the time constant in the system is on the order of minutes and they get measurements on the order of hours. What does that mean? You can't do feedback control like we normally do it. Because to do feedback control, the measurements have to be frequent and they have to be faster than the dynamics of the system. Otherwise, the measurements are pretty useless for what we normally do, right? So this is very common in batch. So you, you run a batch, number one, you may not even need be able to sample the batch. But let's say you can take a sample out during the batch. So what do you do? You send it to a laboratory and then they come back and say, your molecular weight's bad. And you're like, oh, my batch is done. <laughs> okay. so. This is a very common thing. So normally you don't even bother trying to take these quality measurements during the batch. You run the batch and then you take samples, run them into the lab, and then you try to figure out if it's okay, right? Because the first question is, this is a good batch, can we use it? And the second question, if it's not as good as we'd like, let's improve the next batch. So that's called run-to-run -run control. Okay. So it uses quality measurements from previous runs to adjust. This is not rocket science, right? Like if you're making a polymer, and then you run a batch and you realize the molecular weight is higher than the, than the customer wants, the next batch you try to make the molecular weight less. How do you do it? Well, you have various handles that affect the molecular weight. One of them is so-called chain transfer agent, right? You don't probably, you'd have to know about polymers to know the details that I'm talking about. But, and, and they have, in industry, at least with the folks I've worked, they have recipes for this kind of stuff over the years. Because you can say, okay, great, so my polymer is this much too high, how much should I cut back on the hydrogen feed to, reduce th to increase the amount of chain transfer and reduce the molecular weight? The answer is, who knows? <laughs> but the truth is, because they have done this for many, many, many years, they actually have recipes. If you want to reduce it this amount, then, then um, change the hydrogen, the hydrogen feed rate this amount, okay? So this is pretty archaic compared to, you know, what we normally do, like, you know, designing controllers and implementing them for real-time control, but it's often the best you can do. So an example in uh, semiconductor manufacturing, which is similar to what I just showed you, would be that you'd want to control the film thickness on a, on a solar film and that you could change the, the heating rate, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to run some, you know, you're going to make some solar cells. Are you going to measure every solar cell? No, <coughs> right? And this is the kind of thing we talked about in statistics. I don't know if you remember that, but it said like if you're making a batch of stuff, and you want to characterize how, how good you think the batch is, you can take certain, it tells you how many you should sample out of the batch. You have to go back and look at that. Here comes the man. Let's give him a big round of applause when he walks in. 
<laughs> they like you, at least so far. Um, all right. So you can't get these yet, but you can get these momentarily. All right. So I told me the average was a 62. Is that right? Um, I think it's 64. But 64. Yeah. Okay, and I told him the distribution was quite bimodal looking to me. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people did really well, and for some reason, some people didn't do well. I don't. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now you're you're free to live your life or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one of you asked me to forward an email and it is saying that um, they're looking for a group. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any is there any group that for the project can accommodate another person? So that means you have to be a group of three or less. If it, it, it is, maybe this is a little uncomfortable for you. My wife's trying to get me to worry about people's feelings. So, um, so if you'd like to, if you'd like to chat with me because you don't want to you don't want to reveal yourself in front of this large audience. But this this one student needs needs a group. They're all by themselves now. They they said they've worked to try to find a group and they couldn't find anybody. So if you, if you happen to have an availability, which means you're a group of less than four, it would be really nice. That's another thing she's focusing on making. So I'm nice. She tells me nice is important. I never knew that before. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you want to be really nice and help this student out, come see me after class and I can, I can tell you who they are. Okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. 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 Um, okay. So the idea here is if you're making solar cells, what are you going to do? You're going to actually make a whole batch of these, right? You're not going to just make one and measure it and one that measure it. You make thousands and tens of thousands of these. So you're going to measure the film thickness occasionally. And then you're going to decide if you need to do some kind of <laughs> modification of the process, like change the heating rate to change the film thickness. In the meantime, you might have made a lot of solar cells that don't have the right thickness. And that could be bad. So you understand that measurement's expensive, right? To do measurement, you have to send this thing to a lab and they have to measure the thickness. That requires equipment, it requires people, and so there, it's a compromise between how often you measure and how much you're willing to sacrifice a batch, let's say. Um, so I already went through this example. Right? If you don't like the molecular weight of your polymer, you might chain, chain the so-called chain transfer rate, like hydrogen addition rate, to get the molecular weight back on target. Um, Let's just stop there. All right, so I'll pick this up next time.